Louise has told you a lot about shoulder um, protraction, weight bearing, trunk rotation, bending forward, all of these things, and I just want to show you a few of these techniques. Very good, Louise. Okay. The first thing you want to do is make sure she's positioned properly. You don't have much time. That her feet are flat on the floor, and you can start working in this position. Now, what I'm talking about are things that you do with stroke patients, not necessarily a shoulder hand syndrome yet. If I just see the patient for the first time, I might want to see what that patient is able to do for themselves. So I'll have her clasp her hands. The hemi thumb should always be on top. That gets a little bit more abduction, and it's part of the, it's a key point of control that Bobath talks about inhibiting spasticity. And I'm always on the hemi side, and I want her to come forward. And this is a nice thing because it gets some nice range here at the shoulder. She bends forward, it breaks up the extensor tone of the lowers, and this is nice position here and have her come back up again, and I can see how symmetrical she is. Most patients don't like to do this or they're afraid to weight bear and they'll go over to this side. That's not what I want. What I want her to do is come down symmetrically or even bear a little bit more weight on this hemi leg and that reduces tone even more. And sit back up again. Another thing that we like to do is the trunk rotation. You can do this in OT real nicely. And you can do a lot of trunk rotation where she might pick something up over here and she can put it over here. And that gets the elongation of the trunk. When she's this way, you can see this nice stretching and elongation of the trunk. At the same time, she's getting protraction and she's getting the trunk rotation. Now, something that I think is the most important and I think every patient should be able to do this is weight bearing over on that side. When I do weight bearing with a patient, what I want to make sure, first of all, is that I get that nice scapular protraction and it's gliding. I sure don't want to just take her arm and crank it into abduction. The point you should make, when you lift my arm, you brought the scapula first. Uh huh. That's I cradle really her important. arm here. I am not lifting her arm up like this. I'm cradling her arm. I feel, I just automatically do this. I put my hand on her scapula and feel that glide. If it isn't gliding, then I'm going to change and make sure it's gliding before I do anything else with her arm. I can slide my hand down here. This is a nice grip to use. If you can see my hand here, I'm bringing her into wrist extension, finger extension, and a little bit of abduction of the thumb. And I'll bring her right on over, and she can do some weight bearing. I don't want to sit on that. Mm -hmm. She can do some weight bearing on over her hemi side. If she's subluxed, if she's flaccid, or if she's spastic, it makes no difference at all. Nice weight bearing over onto this side. Help with a little bit of external rotation here, and I can put my forearm against her elbow so she can't buckle. Mm -hmm. Can you buckle? No. Nope. Okay. And once again, this is normal. I'd sit watching TV feel almost like if this. If you do this with your patients, you can alleviate flexion contractures of the wrist. You can get a lot of inhibition. You get lengthening of this trunk, and the weight bearing gives proprioceptive input and encourages the um, return of the upper extremity. And there's a lot of things you can do now in weight bearing in this position. Now, let's talk just real briefly. We have a couple mm. minutes about shoulder pain. I would not put someone with a shoulder hand syndrome and a swollen wrist into this position because you can cause problems there. If I want to do weight bearing over onto that hemi side, I can do it on a forearm, but I am not going to put a wrist into hyperextension if they have pain and swelling there. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little more about that? No, well, I think that's a good point, just to make, like, if, if I were going to have Jan weight bear through her shoulder like this, I'm a left -hand. and maybe she was frightened, I'd probably bring her down onto my leg and support her here. And that would be probably as far as I might go. But once again, if they have swollen hands, painful hands, don't try to do this. This is bad. Now, one question I get a lot is if they're not able to come into full extension and it's just a pulling pain here, like the first time you touch your toes, it hurts behind your knees, start off a little bit from the edge. And then you don't have as much full extension of the wrist and fingers. And then you can slowly and gradually work back up again. One thing to remember, patients who have painful shoulders, Jan's already talked about this, you come in and our first reflex is to look at their arm and you go back, no, don't touch it. And that's a good point. You shouldn't touch it. Do these things where the patient is doing it for himself. Leave the hand maybe alone. And just do the facilitation from the scapula. It won't be painful. You then. can get as much range of motion doing this, doing this as you can doing this. And that's more painful. Right. Let's and do, we have time one for one thing. One thing I'd just like to show you that's really nice is that if she does have a painful shoulder, I might want to move her body against her shoulder instead of trying to move her shoulder. So I would, you're down. I'm going to try to get out of the way here. I would just support the arm here. She comes down and 
supports herself. She lets her body come down. And I'm watching the shoulder all the time, keeping it into protraction as she comes down onto her scapula. Now she's down here. I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to make sure she has a lot of protraction. And then she is going to move her body against, away from her shoulder, come back again. And this way we're having adduction, abduction, and, a shoot. and I can also keep this here and move her legs, working through the trunk. That's going to relax to inhibit that. And when I feel it releasing, I can start slowly bringing the arm into more flexion if I want. Tell me and the patient doesn't realize what they're doing, and that's also sometimes very helpful. Coming up to sitting again, bend their knees. I'm going to support this arm and not let anything happen and bring her back up into sitting and down. Okay, and that's just a short review of what we might do with a patient with shoulder hand syndrome. Prevention is the best thing you can do. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Susan? Thank you both for a lot of good information. At this point, I think it might be helpful again to refer you to your teleconference information packets. If you look at page two, the table of contents, you'll notice that our next content area is adaptive equipment. Following that, we'll once again open our phone lines and take your questions about the shoulder and about adaptive equipment. So if you have any questions, you might want to forward them to your site coordinator as soon as you can. Adaptive equipment, to use it or not to use it, and if you're going to use it, what kind to use, is a source of concern for everyone dealing with hemiplegia. Over the next few minutes, Louise is going to discuss the pros and cons of some adaptive equipment. Where do we begin, Louise? Where do we begin? Good. Uh, the first thing I would like, first comment I would like to make is that it seems to me, after working in the setting I've been working in for this amount of time, it seems to me that most of us start putting an, on adaptive equipment, if it's PT, OT, also in the nursing sector, when we start having, what should I say, misfortune with our treatment, when we're not getting as far as we think we should mm -hmm. be getting, and we start thinking, oh, what am I going to do? Well, I'll just start putting on things. Because we don't know how to treat this patient. How to, to get, get around a roadblock. To get block. around it. Yeah. And that is the problem. And, I, I don't know, I've seen so many people walk out of the clinic without any adaptive equipment. It must really be this. But in any case, I thought we'd take a look at some of the things we have here. Let's start first with canes. And the most favorite thing, of course, are these two. Not favorite for you. No, they're not really my favorite. <laughs> most <laughs> widely used, perhaps. But. Let's put it that way. The most widely used things are these quad canes. I think we've all seen this. And the hemi walker, I think we call that. We don't have these in Switzerland. Actually, we don't have these either in our clinic. But we give these to our patients because we think they are really going to be sure of themselves when they're walking with this cane. They are certainly not going to fall. And then they look something like this. I think I can do pretty apt. <laughs> something like that. Yeah. Well, relative assembly. And what we have is somebody walking with two canes and one leg. And the problem we run into is that without that, they cannot, for example, open their doors. They cannot stand up from the toilet. They cannot do many, many things because they have to have that. They have not learned to stand on two legs. And most of the people can learn to stand on two legs, to make a point. And this is not much better. The same thing. Now, it's interesting. One lady came to treatment in Valence from Canada, walked into the hotel with one of these four-point canes, and one of the other hemi said to her, you're not going down to the clinic with that, are you? You want to keep it? And, she's, and she came down without it, yes. And they she did keep it. <laughs> They're all in the closet. They're all they in the closet, They must have 50 yes. of those in the closet. Yeah. Um, what we do have sometimes is just a regular cane. And most of the patients, we have very few people walking with canes, but there are quite a few patients who, when they go outside into traffic, for example, get nervous and they feel sure. they feel good with this just just so they have it in case they have to stop they're not really using it with a lot of support they're really independent 
but it, it is a psychological help to have it there. But they're walking on their two legs and not walking on a cane. And I think that is really very important. If you have people walking on these kind of things, I'm not an advocate of just taking everything away in one blast, saying, OK, she said you could walk, now walk. No, well, um, try just a regular cane first. I'm pretty sure that if they can walk with that, they can walk with this. And if they can walk with this, maybe they can walk without it. Try it. It'd be interesting. Can I show you some other things, sure. Susan? I have a couple orthotic devices here. I think most of the therapists in, have probably seen these things. This thing, uh, orthotic device, is a plastic, I think you call it AFO. AFO. I'm not really familiar with the terminology anymore. And uh, I've had people come in with these kind of braces too. And what we see here is that usually you have to think, why are you putting something like this on a patient's foot? What exactly is it? Do they have a drop foot? Do they have a spastic foot? Are they hyperextending at the knee? Why are you putting that on there? And then you have to think to yourself, is that really where the problem lies first? And if you think it is, good, that may be, but then discover why. Now something like this, if the problem is a drop foot, yeah, I'm sure. But if the problem is really spasticity into plantar flexion and, and inversion, supination, I don't think that will hold it. And there's all this information back there. There's enough play in this that the patient can go into, into the extensor synergy and push against it and always be getting the information to stay in the synergy. It's hard for them to wait there and to inhibit themselves with something like this. We have another type of orthotic device here. It's actually a double upright. It's a clen double Clenzac joint. And Very this is a traditional piece of orthotics. Mm -hmm. And this thing is heavy. Do you want to hold that? Sure. Let's see. Try walking like with one of those sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it really is. It really is. See if you is can walk true? normally. Yeah. yeah. And this, these are steel bars. This will not bend, I'm sure. <laughs> I could not bend this. And what, what do I need something like that for? Do we have really someone who is that spastic that needs these steel bars? And another thing, if they are really spastic, they're going to be turning in the shoe. The foot will be turning in the shoe. And what you'll see is this straight and the whole shoe twisted because this is not taking care of the problem. And if it's only a minimal amount of spasticity, something like this is really heavy that's not necessary. But it is traditional. Good. Now, I, have, I brought with me from... Well, I didn't bring this with me. I have to thank the orthotic department in Harmerville. They made a so-called Valenza brace for me for this conference. Last. And this is uh, the type of orthotic device we do use in Valenza when we have someone who is very, very spastic. That means that I've tried to control the spasticity from the pelvis. I've tried to inhibit it. And no matter what I do, as soon as they come into the swing phase, the foot turns, and it's dangerous. And they are, perhaps, almost going over onto the lateral malleolus, and I don't want that to happen, of course. So I'll give them this brace. This is just a medial bar with a single Clenzac joint. You can set it however you want. And the main thing here is a lateral T-strap that is holding the foot in the shoe in a neutral position. We just have it here with a peg. You can do it with... Hold it still and show it. I just a minute, I'll try to get that like this. Like, this is just a peg holding the T-strap. It looks like this. <laughs> And like that. And the thing about this shoe that's important too, if I just can say, don't have rubber soled shoes or anything that'll stick on the floor and cause your patient to trip. Leather is the best. And a good solid shoe you have to have in any case. That's yeah. a nice story. So you're not saying never use adaptive equipment. No. What you're saying is use it but use it judiciously and have only a, when it's as really a last resort. Yeah. have a reason for it have you have tried every other kind of treatment you can mm -hmm. do and you just are not making it and then you go to adaptive equipment mm -hmm. something i'd like to show you just really quickly is something we use instead of making orthotic devices right away we will wrap up a person's foot and this is so easy a lot of times a therapist will say to us well what if what if we just need it for a short amount of time. He can't walk, he's going home, but he can't, he still has toe drop. 
And you have the feeling in three or four weeks that this is not going to be a problem, but you've just ordered a three or four hundred dollar piece of equipment. Yeah. This is something you can do that's real nice yeah. and temporary. This is really temporary, and this is over the shoe. This is not inside the shoe. It's a regular Circle Eight bandage, and what I or wrap yes. up. What I'll do is I'd normally be sitting in front, and I'll inhibit her foot to You're full dorsal that. extension and neutral. Now okay. I'm going to start over the top and. Just hook it in a minute. And every time I'm going to pull up on the little toe, up and around, and go down and under, and pull up on the little toe. And by the time I get done with this, she is going to have a very, very stable foot. She will not be able to go over on the lateral malleolus, and she can walk around with this. That keeps me everted and my toes up, and mm -hmm. it really does help. And, and you just, don't need it for a long period right. of time. And I'll just clip it, and I'll let her practice walking with this. And I'll practice walking with this. But you put it over the shoe and give it a big tug. Mm -hmm. yeah. It has to be very snug. If it's too loose, it'll just fall. It's not going to do you any good, That's sure. No. Good. Now, and then um, what we can do now is maybe, now that we've talked about these ortho orthotic devices, we can take a look at people really walking with them. Patience. That's the best way. Good. Could we roll the tape? Now we see one of our patients with a quad cane and an orthotic device. Now let's take a look at this man and see where the problem is lying. You see, he's having trouble with his swing phase. Now look at that. First of all, he's sticking a little bit, and he's sticking his uh, hip into retraction, trying to get the leg through. I'm sure this is not the lightest thing for him to swing. Uh, she's making the turn. Now watch the start again. First of all, always start with stance phase on the hemi leg when you're going to do gait because it'll inhibit, inhibit spasticity. Oops, now he can't get through. But he can't get through. It's not because of his foot. It's because his hip is staying up in retraction and extension. And I'm sure the therapist is doing quite a lot of facilitation to make it as easy as it is. But his problem is also not in the stance phase. It's really definitely swing face. And the way he's using his quad cane, I can't imagine that it's really necessary. Now with this man, he's really quite independent. And I'm sure he'll get along just fine without a cane. He has a little bit of problem with weight bearing on the, on the involved side, but I'm sure not that much. And outside in traffic, he might be more comfortable with the cane. The cane is a little higher, so he doesn't leave, lean over onto it. And that's how it looks in reality. Good. Okay, so adaptive equipment, but use wisely, and right. only when it's absolutely necessary. Okay, next we will open our phone lines and take some of your questions and comments for Louise and Jan. We're going to take a phone call in just about one second, but first I want to ask you a quick question. Where do we go to learn more about the bow bath approach? As, as you said, your four hours is tremendously helpful. It's a real basis, but where, where do we go for more? Jan? Um, Harmerville offers courses in bow bath techniques for occupational and physical therapists. The other thing that would probably be, if you weren't in the, you know, where you're able to get to Harmerville, is there are courses that are offered all over the United States not in great frequency, but there are courses offered for bow bath techniques with adult hemiplegia. And probably if you looked through your professional journals, you would see those being advertised. Okay, mm -hmm. fine. Thanks. All right, let's take our first phone call. Mm -hmm. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Uh, Cincinnati. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Um, I'm a therapist uh, that, I, that just recently completed the first two weeks of the bow bath course. And our department has been using the techniques since since, uh, since I came back, and I'm most frustrated with the techniques with ambulation. We have an acute setting, and so we're required to get our patients ambulatory as soon as possible. Uh, most problems I've been having is trying to get knee extension without hyperextension of the involved leg during weight bearing while stepping with the sound side. Um, the patient doesn't seem to be able to isolate his knees. I've also been working on um, this, the same technique in a static position or a simulated gait. Do you have any suggestions of any other techniques I can try? I've been using all of the uh, 
um, inhibition techniques were um, inhibiting the compensatory pattern. But I really found that this is very difficult for the patient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a big problem, especially when they're very hypotone. There's not mm -hmm. much muscle tone in the leg, and there you need all your facilitation te techniques. All the, I mean, it, you have to learn this, but heel stomping and, and quadriceps, it, tapping and standing. But when you're standing and walking, you have to support that leg. And what's very interesting is sometimes after you've gotten them walking and trying to get a, a rhythm to it, good, you're working very hard. I'm not saying that this is easy. But all of a sudden, their automatic extension will, will shoot in. But it ha takes a lot of facilitation, a lot. Uh -huh. After Right, and it, it will take a, it will take some time, but don't give up. It'll work. Okay. Do you think that we're walking the patients too soon? No. Mm -mm. I don't think you can almost walk them too soon. Jen, okay. do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. I, the only other thing I want to add to that, not so much with ambulation, is it is frustrating because you can't get everything in two weeks. You try the things that you've learned, but the bigger your bag of tricks, the more chance you have of getting the right thing in there. So it mm -hmm. comes with experience and with coursework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Good luck with your work. Let's take another call. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? From Kansas City. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Oh, we'd like to know a little bit more about the techniques you use when you have a flaccid extremity. Okay. Who would like to handle that? Okay. Please. Well, just as I said, you know, the flaccid leg, the flaccid upper extremity, I work quite a bit in, first of all, I work in supine. I'll do a lot of for example, elevation of the arm, a lot of facilitation techniques, a lot of tapping, um, this kind of thing. I will use weight bearing. That really helps to get the flaccid arm going. Uh, as I say, it's really facilitation again, a lot, in different, in different positions. Don't, don't just put the patient into supine and just work in that position. A lot of sitting, a lot of balanced reactions. You'll all of a sudden have um, muscle tone coming into the arm. I would say just try facilitation again. Okay, thanks for your question. Should we take another call? Okay, hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm from uh, New York City. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Uh, my question is, I'm also working at a, an acute care hospital, mm -hmm. and, and again, the, um, the first goal is really there is to try to get the patient up in ambulatory. Sure. And, um, one thing that I see therapists doing a lot are using knee braces as well. I was wondering if you had any comment on that. Mm -hmm. Knee braces. I mean, I must say that sometimes when the leg is really very flaccid and I want to get them standing and work on balance reactions or just on weight bearing, that sometimes I will make a dorsal splint to stand on to help me with weight bearing because I just don't have enough hands and knees and and everything to take care of everything at one time. I will keep the legs straight that I can work on weight shifts. I will do that, but it's not it's not as a rule, it's just as a help for me at that time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What to do? But, like, um, I've always been, I was always trying to think that, you know, going along the normal mode of development sequence and like you're having people trying to stand up before they can even sit almost before the sitting balance is good. I'm just wondering if that, like I said, it's the acute care setting that's really pushing towards the ambulation and utilization review, et cetera. Well, that, that was something that I have to answer, though, because before I went to Switzerland, I thought the same thing. I thought, we're pushing them, you're, they're pushing them too fast or whatever. What we found is that when you get a paper, patient upright, the world makes more sense to them, and you get more things coming out of the patient. When you get them upright, it really does seem to progress the patient along faster. The other thing we have to be a little bit careful of is we do talk about normal development, but we're not expecting an adult hemiplegic patient to follow that they can crawl before they um, kneel, before they stand, before they walk, that sort of thing, because it isn't a pure developmental sequence when we're talking about adult hemiplegia. Okay, does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you very much. Thanks for your call. Let's take another one. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? Columbus, Ohio. Welcome to the teleconference. Go ahead. Okay, you've already addressed this question, I believe, but it is, do you suggest any special techniques to facilitate normal swing phase and gait, or does this improve with your techniques, which you've already shown us? Uh, someone had also had talked about gait already, and gait is 
difficult to learn because it's, we just don't know the normal that well. But the normal swing phase, I'll just try to explain it really quickly, is almost a total facilitation from the pelvis. When the heel comes off the floor, you, your hands should be guiding the patient's pelvis down and under, and you'll feel yourself, as you do that, the knee will come forward, and that's exactly what you want. Facilitate it from the pelvis, down and forward. Try it on your, on your colleagues. <laughs> it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take another call. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? From Aberdeen, South Dakota. Welcome Ooh. to the teleconference. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead with your question. Uh, please explain the proper transfer from a wheelchair of an adult hemiplegic patient into and out of an automobile. And would you suggest using the front or the back seat? Thank you. Mm -hmm. A little thinking going on well. up here. <laughs> the principles are the same, except mm -hmm. that you can't always obviously transfer to the hemi side. I mean, depending if you have to get them in the front seat of the car, if they're left hemi, they're going towards their weak side. If they're right mm -hmm. hemi, they're not going to be getting on the driver's seat, right? <laughs> you have a height problem there, too, very probably, don't you? Because the, the seat mm -hmm. of a car is, unless it's a sports car, is, is almost invariably going to be higher than the seat of a wheelchair. Actually, that's not the problem. It's usually the space problem. You're, you're so trying to get into a yeah. small area. But yeah. I must, must say, if there's a problem, I usually try to go into the front seat. The other thing is... And is come forward, exactly as Jan said. The transfer that Louise showed, the moderate assist, where you get the patient down and you're having your hands on their scapula, seems to make seems a to difference mm -hmm. because you can swing their hips quite a bit if you have control over the scapula in their back. And you can bring them forward, swing them around, and get them to come into the, the car that way. And you recommend mm -hmm. the front seat rather than the... Well, just the door opens space, wider. The door sure. opens farther. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take a question from our studio audience. This time, hi. Go ahead. I'm a physician, and now that you got your patient in the car, let's suppose they went to a supermarket and, although they shouldn't, fell over a banana peel. How do you instruct the families to help the patient get up? That's good. It's a good question. And we work very specifically with our patients from get, on getting up and down from the floor, and I think that's very, very, very important. And what sure. we do is we teach the patients to come up over, um, what's that called, hand and knees up under their, Quadru come onto their hand, under quadrupod, come up into kneeling, come into half kneeling, but weight bearing on the involved leg with the, with the uninvolved leg up and then up. But we work with them on that. That's not easy the first time. <laughs> That's how we do it. Okay, let's take another question from the studio audience. Hi, go ahead. Hello, I'm Anita Letterly. I'm a registered nurse and I work in a rehab center in the mm -hmm. Pittsburgh area. I'd like to refer back to that first transfer technique that you demonstrated and ask whether that's the type of transfer we would use with a very heavy patient who was also one who was pushing uh, away from her affected side. Mm -hmm. Would you advise that? Yeah. Or would you use another No, I would person? probably use that one. And I would use that one because of the fact that she has so much, you have so much flexion in their hips that they can't push back. And that's the main thing. You have them locked in. That's the best for that kind of patient. Mm -hmm. Thank Good, you. Good, thank you. Okay, time for one last quick oh, phone okay. call. Hi, you're on the air. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Sacramento. My name is Ursuline Knowles, and I have taken a course in Valence a few years ago. Ah. I'm having problems with a patient with severe extensive thrust. No problem in the stand space, but the minute we start shifting the weight to the non-involved side, he shoots into this, you know, adduction, extension, plant flexion, and I'm wanting some help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what I would suggest there is what we do very often with this kind of patient. First of all, the control has to be from the pelvis again because that's where it's starting. If the mm -hmm. pelvis is inhibited, the rest of the leg will follow suit. But often with the extensor thrust, you can try, I don't know if your patient's ready for this, but stairs because that's an automatic thing. You're used to going up and down stairs. You know what that means. And you can teach them to let go of that leg without the plantar information. Stops the extensor thrust. Okay, thank you for your call. In fact, thanks for all of your calls. We are fast running out of time, but before we close, I would like to ask Jan and Louise one last question. In just 30 seconds or so, if you could sum up what you feel is the most important message that our audience could take home with them today, just what would that message be? Jan, can we start with you? 
I think from my point of view, the most important thing that I would say right now is that the importance of the shoulder and how much trauma and damage can be done if we don't do things properly. A, a question I get all the time from patients is, won't that cause a prolonged stretch and joint damage without a sling? And Kaye told me in a workshop I went to him, to his, he said, he can, I can quote him on this, it will not cause any prolonged damage, joint pain by having that arm bound to the side. And just to make sure that we prevent it from happening and that we really look carefully at the hemiplegic shoulder. Mm -hmm. Okay, Louise, how about you? I guess what I'd like to say is that I know we can improve the quality of our patient's life. I know that it's possible for them to be much more independent than they are right now and to be n more normal. And I th know we can achieve this also through a team concept with all of us working together to reach the same goals and that the patient is the main person involved here and that we're the team working for him. And I think that's it. Okay, memorable, strong statements. Right. Mm -hmm. In closing, I would like to thank our studio audience for joining us today, as well as our audience members at the viewing sites across the country. We're glad you've been with us. And I especially want to thank our presenters, Jan Davis and Louise LaPitz, for sharing their expertise with us. A few quick notes before we sign off. First, inside your teleconference information packet, you will find an evaluation form. We would very much appreciate it if, before you leave your site, you would take a minute to fill out the form and give it to your site coordinator. The information that you give us on the forms will guide us as we prepare future teleconferences like this one. And speaking of future programs, the Harmerville Rehabilitation Center will be broadcasting another teleconference later this year on June 4th. Its topic will be manual therapy of the back. Techniques, concerns, and issues involving back therapy will be addressed by a panel of experts, including such noted names as Sandy Burkhart, Renee Caillé, and Freddie Carltonborn. Finally, if you or someone you know is interested in receiving a videotaped copy of today's program, you can contact the Educational Resources Division at the Harmerville Rehabilitation Center. The phone number there is area 412 828-1300, extension 533. That's area code 412-828-1300, extension 533. Once again, from everybody here in the studio at Pittsburgh and at the Harmerville Rehabilitation Center, thank you for your participation today. Goodbye. <laughs>